Hi, I'm Soren Bjornstad, and today we're going to talk about edge-notched cards. Now, you've probably never heard of edge-notched cards before, unless perhaps you just learned about them a few minutes ago and you found this video by searching for more information on them. These were actually quite important back in the day, prior to the widespread availability of reasonably priced personal computers that could accomplish the same tasks. These are a kind of mechanical database that was used pretty extensively in a few applications. Now, this video is a little bit different from many of the ones on my channel. Uh, typically, you'll see me doing something on the computer using shiny new software applications, whereas right now I'm pointed at a desktop with some little slips of paper on it. So not cool in the 2020s. But there are a couple of reasons why I think this is actually a very good fit for this channel and totally worth talking about. First of all, these are just really cool, especially to modern audiences where we're used to requiring silicon chips in computers in order to do kind of uh, automatic filtering and sorting operations. Edgenosh cards show us that it's not really about the actual implementation, but more about just how we choose to encode the data. And there are all sorts of different physical means, uh, both visible and microscopic, that we can use to actually accomplish that task. Second, Edgenosh cards actually bear quite a lot of architectural resemblance to TaleyWiki, which is a topic that I talk about a lot. In fact, I explicitly drew this analogy in the Tiddlers section of my Grok TaleyWiki textbook. I said a Tiddler is very much like an index card, or better yet, an edge-notched card. So uh, here's how that works, right? There's a small amount of information that fits on this card. Now, maybe we could go on to the back, or if you wanted to, to be really retro and contrary and prove me wrong, you could maybe like cut a little hole out of here and add some microfilm in there. But even if you did that, it still wouldn't be all that much information on one of these tiddlers. In addition to having a small amount of information, um, you have the ability to, to resort and refilter these and thus use them in all kinds of different contexts by punching metadata into the row of holes up here and then mechanically filtering on it using this sorting needle. And we'll see how that works in a little bit here. Now, people often say these edge notch cards are a dead medium and you can't use them anymore. Obviously, this isn't really true since I have a couple of them on my desk right here and I'm doing a video about it. What is true is that you can no longer generally buy the pre-printed and pre-punched ones, which are certainly easier to use. Occasionally you can find them on eBay, especially if you put them on your watch list and wait around for a while, but they're fairly expensive and it's difficult to get uh, the quantity that you might want of a particular size. However, it is relatively easy to make these yourself at home. It just requires a bit of patience because you have to punch a bunch of little holes into a lot of pieces of paper. I will actually do another video on this shortly showing you how you can do that if you want to try these out yourself. In the meantime, let's see how these actually work. So let's take a closer look at how the holes in these cards actually function. On a commercial edge notch card, this row of holes would run all the way around the card on all four sides. I don't remember exactly how many holes that ends up being on the 3x5 card made by Royal McBee, which is the company that made most of the tools like this sorting needle and the cards used in this system. But I think judging by the size of the card, it's probably somewhere from 60 to 80. They also made a 4x6 and a 5x7 card, and I think maybe a couple weirder sizes as well. The benefit of the larger cards is not just that you can fit more information on it, but also that there's more space for holes. So you can also encode more data in those holes. On this homemade card, since I had to punch all the holes myself, I worked out how many holes I would need for this example and punched only that number of them, just so I wouldn't have to spend a bunch of extra time punching little holes in cards, because that's not really very entertaining. Speaking of encoding information in holes, each of these holes represents one bit of binary data, just a lot larger than you would see it in a computer. If there's no notch and there's a full hole that hasn't been punched out, that represents a zero bit, and if there's a notch, that represents a one bit. The way this works is that when you insert the sorting needle through a zero bit, it will remain on the needle, whereas when you insert the sorting needle through a one bit, gravity will cause it to fall off as soon as you let go. If you have a series of cards that have been notched this way, you can sort them all in parallel using this method by inserting the needle through all of them. So let's try that with the second to rightmost bit here. I'm going to insert the needle through there, and I'm going to tip them straight up and then lift the needle. And we'll see that it separates into two piles. This bottom pile here, the ones that fell out, this position should be a one bit on all of the cards. So we'll see indeed that the second to rightmost 
bit on all of them is notched. And the ones that remained on the needle, again, when we look at that second to rightmost bit, we're going to see that it is a zero bit or unnotched. It's possible using this uh, Royal McBee sorting needle to sort about a thousand cards at a time. The length of the needle is actually adjustable by loosening this and sliding it in and out of the handle. But a thousand is about the limit because when you get too much more than that, the weight of the cards on this needle is going to cause it to bend and it's very hard to make a needle that can actually support that weight. However, if you do need to sort more than a thousand cards, you can always do one set of a thousand, then do the next set of a thousand and simply combine the results at the end. So far, the meanings of these holes are completely opaque. We have no idea what each one or zero bit represents. This makes the card pretty much useless because you can't perform any useful filtering operations unless you know how to translate what you want to look for into a pattern of holes on the card. On a commercial card, these holes would be numbered and they might also have a helpful legend suggesting what you might want to use the holes for. I have here a book from the time period which shows an example. Um, this is, I believe, a bibliography reference card. And you can see that clockwise, the holes are numbered in this top row from 1 to 75 all the way around. And then inside, it has a 7421 encoding for numbers. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And uh, a series of letters for perhaps the author's last name or something like that. This book, by the way, is A Guide to Personal Indexes by Foskett, uh, published by Archon Books. You can find that perhaps through interlibrary loan, or I believe I found my copy on eBay used uh, when it was discarded from a library. If you are interested in Edge Knots cards, that is a super interesting read for how individuals might have used these to organize their own lives at the time. In any case, whether we have a commercial card with that neat legend or homemade cards with nothing at all printed on them, we're going to need some way of aligning each numbered hole or not numbered hole with a particular function. The way that I do this is with a mask card. I assume this was a reasonably common uh, idea back in the day as well. And this simply has every hole neatly labeled with its exact function. And you can always place it on top of the other cards because it has the same pattern of holes punched into it, thus the name mask, only all of them are always zero bits. So it will never fall out. It will always stay at the front of your needle as you're sorting. And so you can say, oh, well, I want to see all animals that fly, right? So I'm just going to insert my needle through there and lift and out falls Sparrow, which flies. And indeed, I know it is the only animal of the ones that I have in this deck that flies. Let's see another example, fur. So we'll look for all animals that have fur. And we got cat, chimpanzee, dog, and squirrel, all of which have fur. And the ones with the zero bits which stayed on the needle are human, dolphin, and sparrow, all of which do not have fur. You can see here that these three walk, fly, and fur, these are a very simple encoding method. Uh, we might call them in computing Booleans. They're on or off, yes or no, true or false. Um, can the animal walk? Can it fly? Does it have fur? So let's talk about encodings. Let's suppose that we want to store the first letter of each animal's name in a format that we can mechanically filter on, as indeed we're doing over here on the left side of the card. We'll look at what I've done on this card in a moment. First, I want to take a look at a simpler example from the Guide to Personal Indexes book that I was showing earlier. On this card, as you may recall, on the left and right sides, there are a series of holes which are each associated with a single letter. There are 26 holes in total. If we want to record that the animal's name starts with G, we just notch out the G hole. And then if we want to find all animals whose names start with G, we will stick the needle through the G hole and keep all the cards which fall out where there is a notch there and we have the animal cards whose names begin with G. Very simple, but it has the significant disadvantage that it requires 26 holes to store one letter, which is not very efficient, especially given the very low data capacity of an edge notched card. This stores 75 bits and uh, that is somewhere around nine bytes in a modern computer, which is ridiculously small, as you may know. So in general, we want to limit the number of holes that we need to use as much as possible. Over here, I've used two tricks in order to reduce the number of bits we need to store a single letter from 26 to just six. The first is that I've paired up each of the letters, thus having the number of distinct categories we need to be able to code from 26 to 13. Obviously, this loses a little bit of information. We're no longer going to be able to mechanically distinguish between A and B or C and D. Uh, we'll still be able to distinguish between B and C because those are in different categories. However, we are going to get some of what we call false drops, which is where when we're looking for C, 
uh, we end up having some cards fall off the needle or drop, which actually begin with D. There are ways of reducing the number of bits used for an encoding that don't cause any false drops. The other trick I used here is one of those. But in general, a few false drops are going to be a necessary evil in edge-notched cards if you want to pack a large amount of information into this set of holes. A little bit of manual sorting is usually not that big a deal as long as you judiciously choose what things you need to manually sort. The second trick I've used here is rather than each category being a single hole, each category is represented by a pattern of two holes or a combination of holes. So if it begins with A or B, we punch holes one and two. If it begins with C, D, we punch holes one and three, and so on and so forth, all the way down this little table. This means that we're going to have to needle twice rather than once, but we still get uh, no false drops in terms of this correspondence from category to pairing while using uh, six holes rather than 13 holes. So we've almost had the number that we need. It's also possible to use combinations of, say, three holes. This is going to be a little bit more work. We're also going to pack slightly more, in general, um, possible combinations into the same number of holes. It's possible to use too many. For instance, if we did a combination of five holes, there would actually be fewer possible combinations. You can work all of this out mathematically if you're curious. So let's just see how this works. Let's retrieve all of the animals whose name starts with C. So I'm going to stack these up carefully. And we're going to first needle one. And I had one fall out that wasn't supposed to because I wasn't holding it at the right angle. There we go. And I'm going to set these aside, which didn't match. And then we'll also needle three. In computing, this would be called an AND condition, right? We're keeping only the cards that had a one bit in both hole one and in hole three. And we'll set those discards aside again. And here we have four results, cat, chimpanzee, dog, and dolphin. Dog and dolphin don't start with C, so we'll get rid of those as well. Leave us with just the two animals whose names begin with C in this set. Finally, let's talk about how we can encode numbers. Over here on the right, I'm encoding the number of letters in the animal's name. The simplest way that we could probably encode numbers would be to have 10 holes per place, just using the decimal system. So we'd have holes 0 through 9 for the 1's place, holes 0 through 9 for the 10's place, holes 0 through 9 for the 100's place, and so on. This uses 10 holes per digit that we want to record, so it is fairly verbose. Here I'm using the 7421S0 system. It's a very creative name, I know, it matches the labels. This produces absolutely no false drops, but it only uses six holes instead of 10. And furthermore, it is possible to place the zero hole inboard of the S hole so that it takes up a little bit less space around the edge of the card. This is a relatively uncommon thing to do, but I wanted to do this just to show how this works because there are some commercial edge notch cards out there that were used that did have two rows of holes. We'll talk about how that works in just a moment. The way that we encode something in the 7421S0 scheme is we punch exactly two holes, the sum of which is the number that we're encoding in that place. And we have a tens place and a ones place here. So if we want to record the number zero, we punch S and zero. If we want to record the number one, we punch one and S. S stands for single. It means we only punched one of the numeric holes. If we want to record two, we punch two and S, three, two and one, 4, 4, and S, 5, 4, and 1, 6, 4, and 2, 7, 7, and S, 8, 7, and 1, and 9, 7, and 2. You may notice that 4, 2, and 1 also add up to 7, but that's not valid because it would require punching three items, so instead we use 7 and S. You may have realized that the reason we can place the 0 inboard of S is that there is never any reason to punch 0 unless it is the only hole being punched in this place. So we would never want to sum up, for instance, 2 and 0, because it would be 2 and S. So anytime we're punching 0, it automatically means S. And so having the notch in a way that we can't punch 0 without S is not a problem. So let's see how this works. Let's find all animals which have five letters in their name. So we're going to first needle the four hole. And in this case, we're only going to get one drop. It's going to be human. So we don't even need to continue and needle only the one hole here, since we only have one result. This is very common with edge notch cards. Sometimes you're not going to have to carry out all the manipulations in order to get the result you want. 
Something else we can do with edge notched cards is sort. So let me show you how we can sort these by length of word. The basic principle behind sorting with edge notch cards is just that you're going to carry out a series of filter operations, starting with the highest possible value and ending with the lowest possible value. Some encodings make this easier than others. 7421S0 is pretty straightforward. So I know that there aren't going to be any animals here with more than 19 letters in their name. So we'll start with 19. So we'll needle the one in the tens place first. There's only gonna be one result here, chimpanzee. And so that's gonna cover anything that had a one in the tens place. So that'll be 19 all the way down through 10. So now we get to start with just nine. And nine is going to be a seven in the ones place. We'll keep these drops and set aside the discards for a moment. So nine is gonna be seven plus two. There doesn't look like there are any takers here. So we'll go down to eight or seven plus one. There goes one. And now seven plus S for exactly seven. In fact, we didn't even need to do that because uh, we already covered nine and eight. The only other possible combination of seven and something else was seven and S. So we could have just dropped those if we had wanted to. Now we're going to move down to four. We're going to go for a total number of six. So we'll be doing four and two here, but let's filter out four. And we only got one card, human. So this is going to cover all combinations containing a four. So it'll be four plus two for six, four plus one for five, and four plus S for four. So next we can come down to just the two. And out come cat and dog, which each have three letters. There are no more cards in the discard, so we should now be sorted. We start with items with three letters, five letters, seven letters, seven letters, eight letters, 10 letters, and our cards are sorted. As I mentioned earlier, there are several different means of numeric encoding. Here are just a few that this book suggests. Um, 7421 coding, this is the same as the method that we showed before, but it doesn't include the S and zero. Therefore, it saves two holes, but it also introduces the possibility of false drops. For instance, if we were looking for exactly seven, there's no way to needle for exactly seven. You are also going to get nine and eight by default. If there are a couple of digits, you're probably not going to get that many false drops doing it that way. So it might not be that big a deal. And if you're really short on spaces, it might make sense to do that. Um, there's also pyramid coding. This is kind of just a different way to do it. Um, the number is shown by the intersection of the diagonals. So right here, you can see that they've coded an eight because if you go up that way and up that way, um, those lines intersect at the eight there. Like I said, there's a lot to learn in terms of coding methods. There's also things called superimposed coding methods, which can allow you to pack, for instance, a very large number of subjects, maybe thousands of potential subjects into a series of holes, maybe 40 holes while still having a pretty minimal number of false drops if you want to search for any of those particular subjects. And I'm sure there are even more exciting things out there if you are interested. But this should give you a basic idea of how edge-notched cards work. Thanks for watching.